Uh, uh, and so uh, welcome. This is our lunch study break for Wednesday, June 30th. My name is Rabbi Dan Ain. Welcome to Congregation Beth Shalom's lunch study break. Uh, I was just uh, saying that last week we had the opportunity to study Rabbi Hochstein's Pride Torah. And this week we're going to go back and pick up on the conversation that we were having a few weeks ago. Um, and I mentioned last week that uh, one of the things that I didn't, I mean, I loved pretty much everything about the Torah last week, but one of the things I didn't love about the Torah, if you recall, was that I felt we might be preaching to the choir a little bit. Uh, and I don't believe that I'm going to be doing that this week. So uh, that will be good. But we are going to be picking up to a, on a conversation we have been having. So let's take a look first at where we came from. So we were studying Rabbi Gilman's perspective on the afterlife and the concept of death. What is the Jewish theology of death and the afterlife? And, you know, we went through this. We talked about the book of Daniel. Uh, here it is. We talked about eschatology. We talked about physical immortality, spiritual immortality. We talked about Sherwin Newland's idea about sort of a natural uh, perspective on death. And then we came to this rather mysterious, or I don't know how mysterious it is, but it's the line that I used in my article that we studied, if you correct, I use this line that he has here. I view my death as an enemy to be resisted as long as possible. Uh, and so if I open, let's see a file here and uh, let's see, um, technology after life. Is it here? Yeah, there it is. All right. If I open this, this is my article that we also studied. Can you all see this now? Can you see this article? Did that work? That little, okay. So yeah. there's, my, there's my article. Here it is. I view Neil Gilman's, which we studied a couple of weeks ago. I view my death as an enemy to be resisted as long as possible. Okay, so that's where Rabbi Gilman uh, is coming from. And today what I want to do is study uh, the work of a Jewish philosopher and a Jewish thinker by the name of Leon Cass. Is anybody familiar uh, with Leon Cass? Is that a name uh, that rings a bell for anyone? Okay, I wasn't sure if people would know who. Is, is he the rabbi uh, at um, East Midwood Jewish Center? You know, that's a rabbi cast. I, you know, I really want to know if they're related to each other, because yeah. I was also thinking the same thing when I saw the name Cass, Sandra. So here, here is uh, Leon Cass. He, um, he was honored by the National Endowment for the Humanities. No, it's not the same one. Different guy, yeah, different guy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and he was celebrated uh, in 2009 for a philosopher who has sought to understand and defend human dignity while remaining a man of science from genotypes to the book of Genesis. Cass has searched for truth in human nature while heeding both the verities of moral philosophy and the facts of our being. And so here, what else I hear? Leon Cass here. He's a public intellectual, he was on the President's Council for Bioethics from 2001 to 2005, and uh, he's Jewish, and he grew up in a Jewish environment. So Yuval Levin says Leon Cass laid out a path of inquiry showing that those questions that bedevil us most today have been with us for countless generations. Well, that sounds good. That sounds like something I've been saying <laughs> for a while. So he has written this piece that I would like us to study today, which might add more meaning uh, when thinking about our discussion around the afterlife and death. And you might not agree with it. And we don't have to agree with it here. As you all know, agreement is not required. The only thing that is required is politeness. So. <laughs> Let's open it up here, uh, and it is called L'chaim. Oh, it, the, uh, the copy that I have is terrible. So what I want to do, see, I used one of those Xerox printers. So let me put it in the chat so everyone can have their own copy, because I think that might work better. 
but I am going to scroll through it and I'll do my best to explain it. Don't, if you find yourself squinting, I apologize. All right. So L'chaim and its limits. Why not immortality by Leon Cass? All right. So um, I'm, this is about an 18 page article. So I, I, you know, we've got a little under an hour here. I, conversation is usually more interesting to me. I have highlighted some place that I'm going to spotlight. I might not read every Homer quote in full that he has in this piece. So just a, but you, uh, you just download it there. It's in the chat. So he says, you don't have to be Jewish to drink L'chaim, to lift a glass to life. Everyone in his right mind believes that life is good and that death is bad, but Jews have always had an unusually keen appreciation for life, not only because it has been stolen from them so often and so cruelly. The celebration of life, of this life, not the next one, has from beginning been central to Jewish ethical and religious sensibilities. The Torah teaches us to be fruitful and multiply. That's God's first blessing and first command. We rejected child sacrifice. Judaism has embraced medicine, the human activity of healing the sick. From the Torah, the rabbis deduced not only permission for the doctors to heal, but also the positive obligation to do so. So strong is this reverence for life, the duty of pikuach nefesh requires that Jews violate the Shabbat in order to save a life. So it's not just by accident that we Jews raise our glasses l'chaim. He goes on. We also, as Jews, build hospitals and laboratories. We support medical research. We want our children to be doctors, um, right? And yet so beloved is this for all of its blessing now raises for Jews, uh, Professor Cass wants to argue and humanity, a lot of unprecedented moral challenges that will come in this century. This is about 20 years old, this article. Laboratory assisted reproduction, artificial organs. He says our growing power with science to control human life may require us to consider the possible limits of this principle of L'chaim. One well-known set of challenges results from the consequences of our medical successes in sustaining life. More and more, we are able to sustain life via artificial means. When, if ever, is it permissible for doctors to withhold antibiotics, to discontinue a respirator, to put in a DNR, to remove a feeding tube? All of these are questions that have been uh, on the concern of a lot of Jewish uh, bioethicists over the past several decades. A second challenge concerns the morality of means used to seek the cure of disease or the creation of life. Is it ethical to create human embryos for the sole purpose of experimenting on them? What about to conceive a child so that it could be compatible bone marrow donor? Is it ethical to practice human cloning and to provide a child for an infertile couple? All right, it's another set of questions he wants to ask. Third, we may soon face challenges concerning the goal itself. Should we, partisans of life, welcome efforts to increase not just the average, but also the maximum human lifespan by conquering aging, decay, and ultimately mortality itself. And so before I open it up for just a little bit of a conversation as he enters into this question, he talks about two uh, experiences he had. Um, first one is he went to give testimony at, on human cloning at the National Bioethics Advisory Commission. And he was surprised to discover that the two experts who were invited to give the Jewish point of view had no trouble with cloning. The Orthodox rabbi talked about the goodness of life to be fruitful and to multiply. So cloning could be multiplication and provide people with children who couldn't have one. Conservative rabbi, always a little bit worried, I suppose, concluded that if cloning human beings is intended to advance medical research and cure infertility, it has a proper place in God's scheme of themes. Let someone else worry, Professor Cass says, about brave, new, worldly, turning procreation into manufacture or the meaning of replacing heterosexual procreation by asexual propagation. 
Okay, the second example he gives uh, is in a meeting in March of 2000 when he was on a panel for extending life, eternal life. And he doesn't name this major Jewish speaker. I think it's, it's, he doesn't name him. Major Jewish speaker, professor at a leading rabbinic seminary. Uh, Embrace the project, whole hog, he says. Gently kneading his con Christian colleague by asserting that for Jews, God is life rather than love. He used this principle to justify any and all life-preserving and life-extending technologies. Professor Cass says that when he pressed him in discussion to see if he had any objection to the biomedical pursuit of immortality, he responded that Judaism would welcome such a project. So Professor Cass said, look, I'm prepared to accept the view that traditional Jewish sources might be silent on these matters, given that the halacha could know nothing about test tube babies or cloning. But in my opinion, such unqualified endorsement of medical progress and the unlimited pursuit of longevity cannot be the counsel of wisdom and therefore should not be the counsel of Jewish wisdom. L'chaim, but with limits. So let us address the question of l'chaim and its limits in its starkest and most radical form. If life is good and more is better, should we not regard death as a disease and try to cure it? All right, that's his question here. Um, any thoughts, any responses to that question and to where he is taking us? He's taking us in a different direction than Rabbi Gilman, my professor, who said death was an evil at all costs to be forestalled at all. That's Rabbi Gilman's position. Uh, this is a different take, so it's okay, as always, for us to disagree. Um, but that's the question that he wants to bring up, is we believe in l'chaim, we believe life, bikuach nefesh at all costs, but, but what happens if we take it too far? Can it be taken too far? Don? Yeah, I'd like to start with where he says life is good, uh, death is bad. He started, that seems to be the premise that we'll be going through the head as we read all this stuff. And I basically disagree with that. The thing that death is bad is a mm. real, uh, it, for him, maybe, but for me, no. Death is yeah, death. So you disagree with Rabbi Gilman. You disagree with Rabbi Gilman who says death or the, the rabbis. See, Ra Professor Cass is going to disagree with these rabbis. Um, he's going to say it should be L'chaim, but we have to rein it in. He's going to say what, he, what his analogies there were, he's showing up at all of these national endowment, you know, NIH conferences and the rabbis and the Orthodox and the conservative rabbis there are like, yeah, go clone, go extend life indefinitely. And he's not the rabbi, he's the philosopher. And he's saying, wait a minute, I'm not sure this is wisdom here. This is Jewish wisdom. So that's what that's where Professor Cass is going to go. And I'm criticizing my professor, Rabbi Gilman, at this moment, who believe that uh, death should be uh, fought against uh, at all possible costs. Ellen. I don't, I don't no, have a comment. I just am very much agreeing with Don. Um, would, uh, that you, you're, uh, you're perhaps agreeing with Professor Cass then, where, where, where Professor Cass is taking us. Well, I don't, um, I'm not afraid of death. I, I don't think that, and, and I don't think necessarily that prolongation of life is such a wonderful thing. I think that the quality of life is important. And um, yeah, so let's. So this is where he's. And I also, I also have qualms about uh, some of the very same things that he raises, like producing embryos for um, experimentation, and those things are very disquieting to me. Yeah, and I think what Professor Cass is going to say is that he was surprised and continues to be surprised that the rabbis are as cavalier in their approach as they seem to be. So let's let's take a little bit and see how he addresses it. So he says, first, reputable scientists are today answering the question in the affirmative. The affirmative, the question again is, if life is good and more is better, should we not regard death? as a disease and try to cure it. 
He says, at the moment, reputable scientists are answering that question in the affirmative and making large efforts towards bringing about a cure for death. He says there are three types of research. I'm not gonna go specifically into it. The philosophy is more interesting to me than the science. Three types of inch, a research. The first one are the use of hormones. The second are the use of stem cells. And the third are the use of genetic switches, which are involved in the process of aging. Okay, so if you're interested in that, he goes through those three. But even if cures for aging and death are a long way off, there is a second and more fundamental reason for inquiring into the radical question of the desirability of gaining a cure for death. For truth to tell, victory over mortality is the unstated but implicit goal of modern medical science, indeed the entire modern scientific project for which mankind was summoned almost 400 years ago by Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes. They quite consciously trumpeted the conquest of nature for the relief of the man's estate. And they founded a science whose explicit purpose was to reverse the curse laid on Adam and Eve, and especially to restore the tree of life by means of the tree of scientific knowledge. With medicine's increasing successes, realized mainly in the past half century, every death is increasingly regarded as premature a failure of today's medicine that future research will prevent. In parallel with medical progress, a new moral sensibility has developed that serves precisely medicine's crusade against mortality. Anything is permitted if it saves life, cures disease and prevents death. Regardless, therefore, of the imminence of anti-aging remedies, it is most worthwhile to re-examine the assumption upon which we have been operating, that everything should be done to preserve health and prolong life as much as possible, and that all other values must bow before the biomedical gods of better hearth, better health, greater vigor, and longer life. All right, so that's that's where he's going with all of these. If anybody wants to comment, uh, you can jump right in here. Yes, he says uh, against the gods of better health. Um, well. You know, Ellen made a good point. Quality of life is important, but if you have better health, then you have a good quality of life. So what, what's wrong with better health? All right, there you go. That's right, good, push back. What is wrong with better health? How could anyone in their right mind argue against better health? Uh, I think that's a totally legitimate uh, I, mean, I guess it, it depends how you define better health. Well, he's going to try to he's going to try to pull it out philosophically, Dale. But your initial reaction is, I think, uh, justified and warranted. Marv. Uh, <clears throat> if you go back to the Torah, isn't isn't the part about life, the end of Nitzavim? Where, where Moses, Moses says. Beautiful. Wow, beautiful. <clears throat> no, I mean. Uh, I call heaven and earth to witness against you. This day I, I set before you life and death, blessing and curse, choose life. But, but it then goes on to say, it, it says so that you and your offspring may live. And it gives three things to accomplish that. It then says, as I recollect, it says, love the Lord your God, heed his commandments, and hold firm to him. You know, then it goes on to say, for thereby you shall uh, have life and long endure on the soil that I... I'm pulling it up, Mark. Yeah, that I swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them. So, so I mean, from these simple phrases, you can certainly go to today's topic. But wasn't this more an expression of how the individual Israelite and the, and the uh, kahal, the community, well, that's would, gonna depend. Would, con would continue into eternity uh, uh i mean I, I mean you're asking me is the shot of the torah universal or individual i i don't know how to answer that question well, well no no it's it's clearly individual and you and 
It's particular in its individuality to the Jew and its in and its communal and its community. I mean the Kahal, the Kahila, the Ada, the, That's right. the community. It's not just the individual, it's the community. But of course, it is the also goes to the universal in our destiny. Well, that's why it means so much to us all these years later. So here are the words. See, I set before you this day life and death, death and adversity. For I command you this day to love your God, to walk in his ways, keep his commandments, his laws, his rules, that you may thrive and increase. But if your heart turns away and you give no heed, I declare that this day you shall certainly perish. I call heaven and earth to witness you this against you this day. I have put before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life if you and your offspring would live by loving the Lord your God, heeding God's commandment and holding fast to God. For thereby you shall have life and long shall long endure upon the soil that the Lord swore to your ancestors to give to them. All right. So, all right, Marv, wonderful textual source here. Let's see what Cass wants to do with you it's okay all right i all right um <laughs> you're you're all right so you're a little out of order there with the criticism but that's okay let's let's jump back to where we find with professor Cass. so he's saying let's re-examine there's criticism of this indefinite life that already exists this idea that we're going to conquer aging there is criticism that exists and he just wants to give it to you as uh there's two forms one uh, bad social consequences uh, and distributive justice. Those are the two major complaints if we can live forever. Bad social consequences regarding the former. What about population control? How's that gonna, how's that gonna work? Those are some unfortunate social consequences if people tend to live, how will growing numbers and percentages of people living well past 100 affect work opportunities, retirement plans? I, I, I think I've joked to you previously, Rabbi Gilman used to say death was only a blessing for the associate professor, was a joke he used to tell around the seminary. Even the most cursory examination of these matters suggests that the cumulative results of aggregated decisions for longer and more vigorous life could be very disruptive. All right, so social consequences, that's one. Other critics, they worry that technology's gift of a longer immortal life I, frankly, will only be given to the rich, right? So wouldn't that be the ultimate injustice if it's just the rich who get to have this experience? Um, so against those critics, people uh, who support immortality research say, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out how to make sure everyone gets it. We can handle any adverse consequences through careful planning. Professor Cass said, though I think these optimists woefully naive, let me for a moment grant their view regarding these issues for both the proponents and the critics have yet to address thoughtfully what he thinks is the heart of the matter, the question of the goodness of the goal. The core question is this, is it really true that longer life for individuals is an unqualified good? How much longer life is a blessing for an individual? Ignoring now the possible harms flowing back to individuals from adverse social consequences, how much more life is good for us as individuals, other things being equal? How much more life do we want, assuming it to be healthy and vigorous, assuming that it were up to us to set the human lifespan? Where would we set the limit and why? Anybody want to answer that? Oh, come on. Well, I guess um, do, I, do would have, I would have two, two, two things. One, um, uh, you know, you're not in pain or, or distress, you're healthy um, and, um, and you have enough money to, 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 to have any, everything that you need. So how many, how many more years would you want if you could have health and means? What would be like? If I uh, had health, that would include emotional health, you know, no pain. I, I, I could live forever, yes. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't get to create a utopia. You, you, you deal with the health as best as it's ever been in your life. Let's at least create the parameters there. Oh, it was as best as it's ever been in my life? 
Yeah. Well, now we're getting personal. I, 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 I'm not you, sure. You're, by the way, as always, the rule in this conversation, I'm going to ask questions and everyone is always welcome to decline to answer. Okay. So I, totally re, I totally respect that boundary of privacy. Uh, and I want to show you how Rabbi, not Rabbi, Professor Cass wants to address that. So he says the simple answer is no limit should be set. Let's be simple here, right? Professor says life is good. Death before, is bad. Oh, oh, wait, we got Gary wants to say before something. Before we leave that last thing, Dale did mention something interesting in that the money aspect is that it's not only a personal thing, it's a societal thing. Right. If we assume, if we assume society's resources are finite, how do we allocate resources? The longer life we live, the longer society is going to, I mean, I'm assuming that unless we change the way we work and we work longer, that means that social security or whatever pension. Yeah. You have so I skipped, longer. I very briefly skipped through that. So he has this long paragraph here about the awful social consequences of jobs and money and family life that obviously will take effect. He He's just trying to deal with it so philosophically pure. He says, forget all of those things, all things, other things being equal. Gary, how much more life would be enough for you? How many years are reasonable? He says, what about 10? He says, Gary, would you, it's like almost Abraham, would you take 10? Which of us would find unreasonable or unwelcome the addition of 10 healthy and vigorous years to our life? Years like those between ages 30 and 40. We could learn more, earn more, see more, do more. Maybe we should ask five more years on top of that or 10. Why not 15 or 20 or more? If we can't immediately land on the reasonable number of added years, perhaps we can locate the principle. What is the principle of reasonableness? Okay, well, Gary brought up some concerns. Dale brought up health concerns. Time needed for our plans and projects yet to be completed. Some multiply the age of a generation so that we might live to see, yeah, I'd love to see great grandchildren fully grown. That would be beautiful. Some notion, traditional, natural revealed of the proper lifespan for 120, we like to say, right? May I live to 120. We say that in shul. But we have no answer to this question. We don't even know how to choose amongst the principles for setting up our new lifespan. Under such circumstances, lacking a standard of reasonableness, we fall back on our wants and desires. And he says here under liberal democracy, that means the desires of the majority for whom attachment to life or fear of death knows no limits. I don't know if that's true. He's making an assumption there. It turns out that the simple answer is best. We want to live and live and not to wither and to die. For most of us, especially under modern secular conditions, in which more and more people believe that this is the only life that they have, the desire to prolong the lifespan, even modestly, must be seen as expressing a desire never to grow old and die. However naive their counsel, those who propose immortality deserve credit. They honestly and shamelessly expose their desire. Some, of course, eschew any desire for longer life. They seek not to adding years of life, I think Ellen and Don, said this to start the discussion, but life to their years. For them, the ideal lifespan would be our natural once thought three, now known to be four score and 10, or if by reason or strength, five score, lived with full powers right up to the time of death, which we could come rather suddenly and painlessly at the maximal age. This has much to recommend it. Who would not want to avoid senility, crippling arthritis, the need for hearing aids, dentures, and the degrading dependencies of old age? But in the absence of these degenerations, would we remain content to spurn longer life? He's, he's asking Dale, what happens if I got rid of all of those things? Would we not become even more disinclined to exist? Would not death become even more of an affront? Would not the fear of loathing death increase? We could no longer comfort the widow by pointing out that the husband was delivered from his suffering. Death would always be untimely, unprepared for, and shocking. He quotes Montaigne. I notice that in proportion as I sink into sickness, I naturally enter into a certain disdain for life. I find that I have much more trouble digesting this resolution when I am in health than when I have a fever. Inasmuch as I no longer cling so hard to the good things of life, 
when I begin to lose the use and pleasure of them. I come to view my death with much less frightened eyes. This makes me hope that the farther I get from life and the nearer to death, the more easily I shall accept the exchange. If we fell into such a change, decrepitude suddenly, I don't think we could endure it. But when we are led by nature's hand down a gentle and virtually imperceptible slope, bit by bit, one step at a time, she rolls us into this wretched state and makes us familiar with it so that we find no shock when youth dies within us, which in essence and in truth is a harder death than the complete death of a languishing life or the death of old age inasmuch as the leap is not so cruel from a painful life as from a sweet and flourishing life to a grievous and painful one. This is highly likely and even a modest, pro thus, sorry, Professor Cass says, it is highly likely that even a modest prolongation of life with vigor or even with the preservation of youthfulness with no increase in longevity would make death less acceptable and exacerbate the desire to keep pushing it away unless for some reason such life could also prove less satisfying. So he wants to know, could longer, healthier life be less satisfying? How could it be if life is good and death is bad? Perhaps the simple view is an error. Perhaps mortality is not simply an evil. Perhaps it is even a blessing, not only for the welfare of the community, but even for us as individuals. How could this be? I wish to make the case for the virtues of mortality, Professor Cass says, against my own strong love of life and against my even stronger wish that no more of my loved ones should die. I aspire to speak the truth to my desires by showing that the finitude of human life is a blessing for every human individual, whether he knows it or not. I'm gonna get some thoughts. I have to get a, a seltzer, thoughts? Nobody? <clears throat> um, there's a great book called Die Wisely. And uh, that's Newland, you know, right? Is that Newland? Uh, Jen Jenkinson. Oh, Jenkinson. Oh, Jenkinson. Yeah. Tell us about that, please. Well, he describes himself in the death trade, and he's, he's seen this for quite a while. And, and his job essentially is to help people die. And, and no one seems to know how to do that, at least in our culture. And he, he makes the point that everyone is always fighting for more time. So no matter what, it's more time. But very, very, very few people actually know what more time is for. And it seemed to him that nobody can, can die because they don't understand why they lived. And I, I guess it seemed like, you know, even in the, the passage you cited earlier, when people were given the choice between life and death, it wasn't defined as more time. It wasn't defined as biological life. It was defined as living a certain way right, in line with the Torah. And so I, I guess it, maybe it's semantics, but really life isn't defined. Judaism doesn't actually define life, it seems to me, as as the continuation of one's as life. Time. Right, as time. Different. Yeah, right. Life needn't be time or longevity. That's that's an assumption perhaps where I'm making or we're making, right, Michael? Yeah, that, that's basically what I was getting at. And so so maybe that's really at the core of this is the more the, the time is defined a different way and um and that we're fighting for the wrong thing entirely, if that's what this is focused on. Um Jenkinson, let me just, uh, what was the name of that book again? Because I want to... Die, die Wisely. What was it called? Say that again. Die Wisely. Die wisely. I think I saw a documentary. He's like... He, uh, he, probably did, yeah. he was, yeah, he's known as like the the death doctor or something to that effect. Sort he, of, yeah. And yeah, where he guides people. There's this documentary about he grapples with people's fears of death and then helps guide them through as in, as opposed to having them fight off the inevitability of their right. death. That there's, their suffering comes not from death itself, but actually from resisting death. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great perspective. Uh, other thoughts um, on this? Uh, Marv. Isn't it said that the uh, problem with death is to the Jew that you no longer can do the mitzvot. 
And is, isn't that a uh, underlying concept that we're here? I mean, you know, all of this other stuff about Judaism, okay, but basically you're supposed to be a Jew, you're supposed to do Jewish. You're supposed to do the mitzvot. So if you're dead, you can't do the mitzvot. You can't do teshuva, that's right. You can't do teshuva. As long as there's life, there's the potential for teshuva. That is for sure true. Uh, you know, I, at every funeral, you know, I pull the loved ones aside and we tear the clothing. And I tell them that in our tradition, there is no bracha for death. We have no bracha for death. We say, Baruch Dayan Ahmed, blessed is the one true judge. So we just don't, we don't bless death. And you know me, those of us who remember pre-COVID days, what's my least favorite holiday on the American calendar? My least favorite holiday, much to the consternation of everyone else who lives with me. No, it's not puppy day, although that would apply as well. It's Halloween. I can't stand Halloween. We Jews do not glory in death. That is just not what we do. It's not holy. Death is not holy. We keep our Kohanim away from cemeteries. We don't mingle Kedusha and death. So that's just, that is the predisposition. And Professor Cass, I think, is saying, what is the logical extension of that? Because the 21st century is going to uh, ask some tough questions. Don. So you can't do Teshuva after you pass away? And if you can't, and if you can't, not that I know of. And if you can't, and assuming you're still somewhere, then what's, where's the hope? Uh, the hope is while there's still life, Don. The, but, rabbinic, the rabbinic hope is while there's still life. I, I never, rabbis, you know, as we've been discussing throughout this, so what is the Jewish perspective on the afterlife? We say it's about olam hazeh. It's about making this world holy while we have time. There it is again, Michael, right? That concept of time. By the way, Augustine said, I know exactly what time is so long as no one asks me to explain it. And then once I try to explain it, I'm at a loss for words. Okay. So that was Augustine. So I don't have anything better than that. But um, in Judaism, you're alive. Go apologize to your loved ones. Go, go uh, say you're sorry. Go do mitzvot. Go feed the poor. You're alive. You've been given this breath from God. That's holy. And sanctify the moment that you have now. I have very little to tell you about what will come next. But if you, assuming that I will not reach teshuva in this life, I'm just going to assume that. Uh, what, what, what do they say after I die? If I'm still around, is like no more teshuva for me, no more possibility to do mitzvah mitzvah there. I mean, it seems like it's like if you die and you didn't get teshuva, then then you're dead. Then you're really dead. Uh, you're really dead. It's like no more for you, God. <laughs> God kicks you out. I can't, I don't buy that, go ahead. Okay, no, no, that, I, I love it. Um, and here's a book that I wanna give you to read. It's a book we've studied here. It's Rabbi Gilman's book. It's called The Death of Death and it's exactly his beef. That's his beef in that book, Don. So go get that book because he doesn't buy it either. And he's like, what do you mean? You mean, God, you created me unique in this world with this body and this mind only to make it vanish and disappear? That doesn't make sense to me. And so Gilman endeavored on that book length effort to go through the sources to show um, that this ain't it. Judah. Well, there's a saying in Judaism that one hour in this world is better than eternity in Gan Eden because we can't do mitzvot once we're gone. Well, so that's pretty basic that, Judaism. That, uh, well, that's also, though, I love, first of all, you like killed two birds with one stone there, Judah, because not only are you responding to Don, but you're also responding to Michael and me in the terms of the use of the hour, right? One hour is eternity there, 
right? It's not life is uh, there. There's something about that, you know, um, uh, Franz Rosenzweig quoted uh, in his book, The Star of Redemption from Shir Hashirim. He says, love is as strong as death. And I remember really struggling, <laughs> struggling with that as a lonely kid in my early 20s. <laughs> that was hard. Uh, uh, walking around Jerusalem, struggling with that concept of love being as strong as death. And um, what he meant by that is that that moment that you're in love with someone, that is an, that's eternity in that, in that flash of love. And that's what, makes, that's what makes it as strong as death. That's what Rosenzweig was coming from. Rabbi? I have yeah. To um, so you just said something. I've had a question since yesterday. I was at a funeral yesterday, and it was led by a Chabad rabbi. Um, and I've never been to one of those. And he had this weird box. He brought a box that came up to his, a black box that came up to his waist and he stood on it, in it. And I'm going, what kind of Michigas is this? And then what you just said reminded me his last name is Cohen. Could that have been a maybe there was a platform in the box and that was the way to keep them not connected to the cemetery. Oh, was, was that it like an open box, Judah? Like, like, you know, he could stand in the middle of it, but yeah, yeah. yeah. I've seen, I was, I've been at the Lubavitcher uh, cemetery out at, where is it, Dan and Queens? Yes. Yeah, they, now they put up police tape because apparently the, the, uh, the Tame can't get around yellow tape. But they, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like a sandwich board. You have to hold it up against you. I, I, I didn't do There's it. There's the mom. image right. there. There's a famous wow. image of uh, the, uh, the, the man with a black hat on and a long beard in, uh, on a flight covered in plastic. I think yeah. people yeah. saw that image. Uh, yeah, there is, there's weird halakha around being in or around the airspace if you're a Kohen. And it, so there perhaps might be, maybe that accounts for it. I just, I don't know about that, but I yeah. Kohens were not around. They are not. Because they of are the not. dead. So when you mentioned that, I thought maybe that, maybe it wasn't that. It, what was That's exactly perhaps, right. Maybe there was a flooring in it that it's, uh, he was standing on. It's the same logic they use when they put up an air roof. You know, it's it's you're creating an artificial barrier. Oh, so it's like as if that's a little area outside of the cemetery. Because I know some Kohanim who come to funerals in our community, they stand on the road. They make a point to stand on the road. Gary and then Sandra. So I have a question with your comment about not being able to do teshuva um, after you die. Um, it may not surprise you when my parents died, I studied the halakha of mourning. And one of the things that some people add to the Kaddish when you're in mourning is hareni kaparat mishkavo, um, may I be an atonement for his or her resting place. So wouldn't that be you saying that you can have an influence on their teshuva? There are certainly <laughs> mystical and Haredi beliefs around the 11 months, the year, uh, the flight of the soul up to Gan Eden or wherever it's, yes, there are lots of different mystical Hasidic beliefs, uh, Talmudic, Midrashim, uh, around that. Um, it's all very fanciful, creative, and when sometimes it's very meaningful for people, uh, obviously it's all metaphor. I understand you, it all. You would say, you I would understand say it all as entirely metaphor. And you would say it's not normative Judaism? I wouldn't, I'm in no position to say what is or isn't normative Judaism. Sandra. Well, I remember Rabbi Lou speaking about the Kaddish as saying they need it, meaning that the person who, who uh, was dead, um, our relative needed it from us. So that would uh, yeah. That's why they do. That's why they do eleven months. That's why you do eleven months because uh, and not you don't do the full year, Sandra, because you don't want to say that the deceased needed the whole twelve months of kaddishes. So we stop at eleven because oh, the person is not so terrible. They need the full twelve months of kaddishes. That's why we only do eleven months of kaddishes, Sandra. Though I think you had another point you wanted to make as well. Why? Why do we do it? Why? Why do they need it for eleven months? 
I'm going to answer that it's the humans who are remaining who needs it. Uh, the morning rituals, as I understand them and practice them, are for the living. Uh, and that's how I explain it. I often, I am uh, uh, unqualified, I think, uh, to enter into um, anything on the other side to tell you what's going to happen there. I just don't know. I know they're wonderful stories, the wonderful Midrashim. I can recommend books and stories and legends. Um, I'll give you a... Well, I'll wait until after I stop recording to give you an example. I don't want the example I'm going to give you to be recorded, but if you remind me after I stop the recording, I'll tell you. Jeff. Um, Gary, you may find this useful. When I was, um, some years ago, when I was saying Kaddish for my mother, um, I was in New York and uh, I have friends who live in the NYU neighborhood. I walked down the street to NYU Hillel and I said Kaddish. And afterwards, an Orthodox rabbi, I don't think he was Chabad, uh, came up to me and asked me who had died. I said, it was my mother. She died, I think it was the previous year. And he said, oh, may her neshama have an aliyah. They believe that every year on the occasion of the Yotzite, um, they the soul ascends higher and higher. Eventually it achieves union with God in its ultimate form, which I guess is Ein Sof. Uh, so there is this Kabbalistic influence, but it's not just Chabad. It, it isn't just uh, Hasidim anymore. It's permeated all of orthodoxy. Dan, I got to tell you, you're validating my affinity for Buddhism. Uh, oh, um, I'm validating. Oh, you I, 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 I'm failing, I believe. I, that's not my goal here. How, why am I doing that, Jeff? Because um, um, life at all costs. Uh, let's extend life. Let's improve the quality. I, you know, I. Okay, I told you last, but the I told professor's going to tear that down, Jeff. Rest assured, what? Professor Cass is going to tear that down. Yeah, I don't care. Um, I, <laughs> I told you last week, I, you know, I agree with, I think it was Ellen. I think I, Ellen and I both said, you know, we're not particularly interested in afterlife. And I, and I told you, I'm, I can go tomorrow. I don't care. Um, I, uh, I, when you were studying under Gilman, did you ever look at him and just like give yourself a face palm and think, you're kidding me? He was so depressed. Was he? Was that That's what really was that? At yeah, the blue, but as he blue? got, you know, as he he was always depressed. As he got sicker, he was more depressed. But he always felt unheard, unlistened to, oh. underappreciated. He had a predisposition towards the melancholy. Yeah. I have yeah. to be honest with you. Yeah, so he felt unheard, unappreciated, unlistened to. You know what? There were reasons. Oi, Nebuch, my beautiful teacher who wow. has opened so many doors to Judaism and continues to open doors to Judaism for so many students. And I am blessed to have been his student and to be able to share his Torah wow. with all people, whether they agree or disagree. Judah. Because of the subject, I'm just going to add something a little off topic. I'm going to put in the chat the obituary for the uh, person whose funeral I went to yesterday. He was such an exceptional man. Please do. Uh, he died at 37 of COVID. And he arrived in Sacramento about 11 years ago, Mexican and Christian. And he died as a Jew with uh, rabbis, many rabbis at his funeral. So he was, you know, I want to put that if anybody has a interesting chance to read about him. Yeah, well, that, yeah. May his memory be for a blessing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And you should know that this man here who's going to defend uh, uh, mortality is going to be very explicit in the coming page about that being an awful occurrence. He wants... Oof. Thank you for sharing, Judah. That's heavy. Uh, the, yeah, yeah. Go right ahead. That's hard to, it's hard to jump right back in. Yeah. You said Rabbi Gilman was melancholy. If he was melancholy, then you would think that he wouldn't be in favor of arguing for extending life because when people are melancholy, death is a relief. He had that existentialist ennui uh, that you will find in your people and your philosophers and your rabbis for whom the basic questions of life are a burden on every moment of their existence. So I, that's, he happened to be one of those people and there were days and rituals and practices like Shabbat 
like minion, like reading every prayer exactly the way it was supposed to be read, that helped him um, from moment to moment, maybe appreciate the myth that maybe there is a God uh, and maybe that God really cares about him. Uh, and maybe that God actually has a destiny for him. And that's, that's that book that I just put in the death of death, Don. That's really the sum and substance of that book. Um, ooh, I don't, anyone want to go back to the text? With, with anyone what, actually feel like going back to the text? I don't know. I don't know. If actually, with what you just yeah. said, it, what, it makes me want to know what um, Gilman had to say on Kaplan then. Um, <laughs> well, Gilman loved Kaplan. I mean, I think Gilman was torn between those two. He was, I mean, I think on some days of the week, he was very much in line with Kaplan, which is authority is community. I mean, I can't tell you if there is one thing Gilman was adamant on is that halakha is uh, determined in a complaining sense uh, by the virtues of the democratic people who are making that decision for the sake of community. He's, he believes, that, yeah. So that's interesting, but you know, it, it, you did remind me that he shunned and really hated any changes to liturgy and updating Both. liturgy or even, even if, even if commu like you told me how he hated the Imahot, you know, I mean, and that is, that is, Totally, what against that, this. that is totally Kaplanian. So, I mean, it's interesting. He idiosyncratic. He, I mean, I think maybe you can understand him as a, as a guy who grew up um, as a Quebecois. I mean, you know, he grew up as a Jewish French Canadian. I mean, that's, that's the environment that he came from and very sort of religious, traditional, uh, I think background and upbringing. Uh, and it wasn't until he confronted Will Herberg, who was another existentialist uh, philosopher, um, that he finally began to see an outlet. Um, here, hold on, let me pull up a Will Herberg book to get. So he was a Canadian consumed by ennui, existential ennui. Hard to believe, right? There's no such thing. It doesn't exist. French Canadian. Well. <laughs> all right. All right. That moves it marginally in that direction. Yeah, There's okay. a Herberg. There's a Herberg book uh, for those who are interested. Um, we're going to close here, um, but I want to tell you, and, and then we can continue for a few minutes after the recording stops, but I want... I want to tell you that uh, next week, uh, invite your friends. So we are going to be joined by Madison Margolin, uh, who is the founder of this magazine here. Hold on, let me share it with all of you. It's called Double Blind, Double Blind Magazine. There's a pop-up ad, How to Microdose. All right, so that'll give you a sense of Madison, she founded this organization. Let me see about, Double Blind is a biennial print magazine and media company covering timely untold stories about the expansion of psychedelics around the globe. Um, and Madison, they don't have her bio here, hold on. She also founded um, the Jewish, uh, she started the first Jewish uh, conference on psychedelics. Yeah, Jewish Psychedelic Summit. Everyone see this here? There it is. Oh my God. That's it's, dangerous. No, good. Perfect. Come, Dale. No. <laughs> Come. I want to. Madison is one of the co founders and co organizers of the Jewish Psychedelic Summit. She's the editor and co founder of Double Blind Magazine and has covered psychedelics, cannabis, and Jewish culture for Rolling Stone, Playboy, Vice, Tablet, and High Times. All right, so she actually that would have been the perfect time to bring my friend, the archaeologist, who found out um, the role of cannabis in um, temple period Judaism. Oh, let's let's have him oh, follow really? on there. He should follow on. He should follow there a, on. There was a very important research. He, he that through new technology they had at the Israel Museum. They have a smaller temple period, one of the remote temples, and they analyzed the substance is there, and they found signs of cannabis. Which was oh, that, please, please oh, come. What's, his name? what's the name of the archaeologist He's, who found it? His name is Eran, E R A N, Arye, um, um, A R I E. 
Um, it's published. I mean, he did a lot of uh, media over this. Um, he's, it was fascinating, but um, yeah, they found, and especially it's interesting because cannabis did not exist in Palestine. So they had to bring it in for the temple rituals. It was Which not something that existed. existed. Let, me, uh, wait, let me pause it here. Let me pause the conversation here. So first of all, Gary, Madison will definitely know about this archaeologist. So bring these questions next week for sure, because we'll discuss it then. First of all, you understand where Professor Cass was going. Professor Cass, just so we're clear, Professor Cass was going quality of life, limitations of life, beauty, John Keats, a flower. That's where the rest of that philosophical essay goes. Life is actually beautiful because it is bounded. And when we forget that, we become something different. Ultimately, he's going to argue that if we extend our lives in definitely we no longer become human we are something else altogether and he thinks that that's not great that there is a beautiful thing about where did he human. write this what what magazine did he write humanness it? it's in a book uh oh, it's, it's in a okay. book uh, did okay. you get the copy of it i i put it in well, the I, I see it in the chat yeah okay. great thank you um and so uh join us next week for madison and let me uh, stop it here i look forward to seeing you all next week take care